or out of pieces. What can you say about when you are given a network or you are given a composite system and you want to try and figure out what it's made of? And so this is the type of problem that I'd like to address. Um, and I don't really have so far um, a definite formal framework for this problem. Um, so um, it's more like some kind of preliminary ideas. Um, but I do have, uh, which is in this paper, <clears throat> a framework for one particular type or one particular flavor of network, namely causal networks, space networks. And so I'll talk about this particular case uh, a little bit in the second half. Um, yeah. Okay, so basically the problem setting is this. If you are given the observed behavior of some kind of system, which is a black box to you, you don't know what's inside that box. You only know the, the uh, external uh, observed behavior then what can you say about the internal structure of the box, about what sort of network is inside the box? Um, and so to just phrase this problem, make it more precise in the simplest manner, I'd like to address the question of, given some particular hypothesis about the structure of the network inside the box, is this hypothesis feasible? Is it possible to explain the observed behavior with this particular network topology. <clears throat> uh, and so this is the kind of problem that comes up when you do kind of hacking or reverse engineering systems, right? Then you, you can't look inside, you just can probe it from the outside and you want to reproduce it. You want to rebuild a thing, then it's helpful to have some idea about what's in, what could be inside. But also this is actually from a slightly different perspective in some sense, it's all about complexity theory. So this is uh, basically about circuit complexity, right? When you, when you want to, in this case, you don't have an observed behavior of the composite system, but you have more like the desired, a desired behavior for the composite system. And you're asking yourself, can I realize that, can I achieve this desired behavior using a limited number of components? This is kind of complexity theory, circuit complexity. Uh, and so this also, maybe I can refer back to uh, my title slide and maybe if you're from my generation or maybe a little bit older, you might remember uh, this uh, video game called The Incredible Machine where you have a bunch of, of components uh, which are here on the right uh, and then you are in this situation and you have to achieve a desired behavior which in this case is to get the mouse safely into this um, part. <coughs> And so in this case, how this works is that you can use the trampoline to kind of make this bowling ball uh, destroy the fishbowl and that will attract the cat and then there's this hamster wheel which you can connect to the conveyor belt and that will make the mouse kind of uh, be projected to here and then it will be scared of the cat and so on. There's a Tom yeah. and Jerry cartoon for that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. <clears throat> yeah, so this is, this is this type of problem, right? We have some overall desired behavior and we have a bunch of components and the question is whether we can implement that behavior using these components. Um, and so to do this a little bit more formally, um, again, I'm also going to use the framework of uh, symmetric monoidal categories. So for me, also a system as a morphism in some suitable symmetric monoidal category. <clears throat> Okay, so let me make an example of, of what um, this hypothesis about an internal structure might look like. So suppose that you have some kind of system which has two inputs, uh, five outputs, and you know what, this, what its overall behavior is. So you, have, you are given some kind of particular morphism with these two inputs and five outputs. And you wonder yourself, uh, and, and you wonder, uh, can I write this morphism? as the composite of, let's say, something, uh, some smaller morphisms that may look like this and wire together in some way looking like this. It's just a kind of random example to um <clears throat> Okay, so here one can already read off some necessary conditions. Um, in particular here you can say that whatever comes out here 
it should not depend on what goes in here, right? Because there's no wire going from the left to the right part. <clears throat> so this is, a certain, is certainly a necessary condition um, that the overall morphism must actually factor into a monoidal product. Uh, but this is far from necessary. And so later on, I'll show some. Uh, Sorry, this is far from sufficient. Later on, I'll show some additional necessary constraints that must be satisfied. But before that, let me say uh, something a little about, about the general structure of this type of problem and how much we can actually expect to be able to say at all. Because it's, it's, it sounds like it's impossible to say what's inside if you only know the observed behavior, right? And I sort of don't want to claim that it is possible. Um, Part of the behavior are you observing? You're observing the inputs, the outputs, and the causal dependencies? No, you don't observe the causal dependencies. You only observe, so the overall behavior, which is uh, like um, for an electrical circuit, for example, it would be you, you know what the currents are when you put a certain distribution of potentials, okay. so at, but only at these external ports. But you get to fiddle with one and what? You got to fiddle with all of them, but only with these external ones. Okay. So you assume for every com possible out input, you know the output. Is that? Um, yes. So basically, you know what this morphism is in the corresponding symmetric monoidal category where this thing takes its semantics. So yeah, in the case uh, that I'm going to um, explain later, in the case of um, causal inference. These are, this is, takes place in the category of stochastic matrices, or equivalently speaking, of uh, finite sets as objects, and um, stochastic maps between finite sets as morphisms. And then, yeah, then you would know the distribution over the outputs for any values of the inputs. <coughs> okay. But yeah, so let me say a little bit about what I think one can actually infer, how much one can expect to infer. Um, so first of all, what is actually the structure of the set of these, of, of the feasible hypotheses? So by feasible, I mean that, that a, a, a hypothesis about the internal structure would could have generated the observed behavior. <clears throat> okay, so certainly there, you can take the trivial hypothesis that the network inside just looks like this, <coughs> just like a box that you can't decompose any further. Uh, and this one always works, yeah, because this can explain any observed behavior, any, any, any morphism with two inputs and five outputs as the morphism with two inputs and five outputs. Uh, but in some sense, it's also the least interesting one, right? Because we would typically, I guess, prefer any other explanation over this one. <clears throat> okay, so there's some other um, um, operations that one can apply to one particular, to one feasible hypothesis and get another feasible hypothesis. And one of these is the black boxing. So we've already heard a little bit about black boxing, which just means that you take uh, some subnetwork, let's say this here, and you want to consider this as a single morphism. And just say, okay, let's say, so these individual boxes, and I group some of them together, and then I say I want to consider this subset of boxes as a black box by itself. So but then, well, you need to be careful about what are the inputs and what are the outputs of this new box, so we have to, I have to kind of redraw these a little bit. Uh, and so I, if I apply this black boxing operation anywhere uh, to a feasible hypothesis, then I certainly, again, get a feasible hypothesis, right? Because then I, I still have a, a network topology that can generate my observed behavior. So this is one operation that always works. Uh, another one is that if, if you um, start with a feasible hypothesis, you can add additional wires anywhere. It will still be a feasible hypothesis, right? <clears throat> yeah. So under these two operations, you can take the set of all these uh, wiring diagrams, which are the hypotheses. Um, sorry, could you just clarify the adding wires? So you've got uh -huh. some existing boxes and you just add some wires. Yeah. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you're 
Has this been in the Monoid or I haven't, as I said, I haven't really made any of these things very formal yet. These are just sort of some, some preliminary ideas. Um, right. It's the sort of thing you'd expect when you do a Cartesian kind Yeah, of no, and, but you, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have to remember that these are not particular morphisms. These are kind of blueprints of, okay. this, so is, could, this is this okay. basically a formal string diagram, right? Not, not, it's not instantiated yet with any particular morphisms. So yeah, these are just abstract kind of wiring diagrams. Um, and with the right number of input and output wires, and I, so I consider a set of all these wiring diagrams. And under these two operations of black boxing and adding wires, this defines a, a, a just actually a partially ordered set. I, I would say I go lower in the order if I apply these operations. So the stuff that's high in the order, I, I, would, I would say uh, these are the complex explanations or these which contain a really fine structured uh, network. Adding and so then, wires lowers you? Hmm? Adding wires lowers you in the order? No, I, I would, well, it's conventional and I'm not sure, I mean, I'm open to. Uh, black boxing and adding but, wires. But I was thinking more in terms of a sort of uh, DCPO type thinking or something where higher complexity or, or more structure means that you go upwards. Yeah. And or kind of refinement, refinement goes upwards. Yeah. But this so is that's a top down approach maybe because of oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, good point. Okay. Adding more wires is a, which direction does it go? So in my current convention it goes downwards. But maybe maybe it's better to make it go upwards. I, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of arbitrary. Um, yeah. But in any case, it defines a partial <laughs> order. Um, and uh, so we get a post set, which is kind of parameterized by the number of inputs and outputs of the wiring diagrams that uh, we're considering. Uh, and then also, well, it certainly depends on the particular flavor of my nodal category that one considers. So I could use wiring diagrams for symmetric monoidal categories, for trace, compact, or, or whatever. Um, and I haven't really been very specific about it. <laughs> but I think a general idea should, should apply to all of these. <coughs> okay, and if one wants to do so, one can also introduce a set of types for the wires. Um, so you can say, for example, in, in circuit complexity, well, I really want each wire to be a bit and not an arbitrary kind of system. Uh, and so in this case, one, one can uh, impose or label these wires with additional types, but one doesn't need to, in which case the wires would be allowed to carry arbitrary uh, objects. <coughs> okay, so then the feasible hypotheses, as I was saying, are, are stable under black boxing and are additional, uh, adding additional wires. Uh, so this means that we have a lower set uh, in this post set. And this is basically what I, was, uh, what I wanted to say about how much one can expect to be able to infer. We certainly can tell uh, the exact structure of network that's inside because there's always that trivial hypothesis, hypothesis. But the feasible hypotheses just form this lower set. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And maybe when you would say that, well, the best explanation for what's inside is kind of the one which is the maximal element of this lower set. So it's the most fine-grained one. So the one, the one which is um, most predictive in the sense that it would be able to explain the least amount of other behave potential behaviors. Uh, so to apply this kind of reasoning, one would like to have this lower set, uh, one would like this lower set to have a maximal element, but yeah, I don't know under what conditions one can expect this to be the case. <clears throat> okay, so now uh, let me say uh, something about how one can approach this kind of problem. So, so far I've just been talking about the problem itself, the problem setting, uh, and now I'd like to introduce a technique for actually solving this problem in some cases. <clears throat> uh, uh, and the cases that I can deal with, or to which this technique applies, 
are those in which one has um, an order categories in which the unit object is a terminal object. So if you don't know what that means, uh, don't worry about it. So this basically is just saying that one can discard systems. But there's a way to just take a wire and say that I want to ignore this output. And so I'm going to I'll denote this by this kind of black dot here. So this means just discard the system. Um, and this has the important property that if I apply some morphism, do, do something, uh, and then discard, that's the same as just discarding from the outset. And this is sort of what makes this uh, inflation technique work. <clears throat> okay, so in the particular case uh, for which I would like to show the examples of, of uh, this technique, um, I think I don't have the time to introduce any kind of generalities, but so I'll just illustrate this technique with examples. Uh, and in this case, the category C is going to be this category of stochastic matrices or stochastic maps between finite sets. And so in this case, string diagrams in C are basically the same thing as uh, what's called Bayesian networks, if you know of this, I happen to term. And there's a bit of a subtlety here, which, um, yeah, that um, I'm kind of slightly lying a little bit, but uh, we'll see more about this later. And so this is something that was actually worked out in detail by Brendan. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, now let me get to these two examples of the method. Um, and so the first example is that imagine that you have a black box, which does not, ha which does not have an input, but it only has outputs, it has three outputs. And uh, so in stochastic matrices, that means that it will generate some observed distribution on three random variables. And so let's, just, let's say that this uh, observed distribution is um, perfect correlation between these three uh, variables. And these variables are binary, so they take values zero and one. Uh, and they're uh, uniformly distributed but perfectly correlated. That's kind of, you got zero with probability one half, and then all of them are zero, or you got one with probability one half for all of them. <clears throat> yeah, so now we could try to uh, explain this observed behavior using this kind of network topology. So this would be saying that you have, what in, con in causal inference would be called, you have a common ancestor for uh, each two of them. <clears throat> um, but notably, there's no um, there's no morphism or anything that that would result would eventually connect to all three of them. But we only have pairwise things here going on. Whatever information flow happens here, it can only end up in two of these at a time. And this is kind of. How to, how to think of this network. Um, and this is also the intuitive reason for why this hypothesis is not feasible for this observed behavior. You cannot generate this distribution from this kind of uh, network. <clears throat> and yeah, so let me prove this. <clears throat> and the way to prove this is that I will take this network or take the components of the network, really, and take a bunch of copies of them and rewire them in a different way. Uh, and so this looks like this. So there's this uh, SAC here. I've taken two copies of this. And what I'm doing is basically I'm moving one copy to the left and I'm moving another copy to the right. Uh, and then I yeah, get a new network that looks like this. And here I'm just discarding one half of, of this, what comes out of this uh, source morphism. <clears throat> okay, and so this is a kind of network that we call an inflation or an inflated network. <clears throat> um, yeah, and now we can try to infer something about the behavior, about the observed behavior of this network from the observed behavior of this original one. So are you expecting perfect correlations between the two copies of SA and AB? Between the two copies of SAC? Between SAC, this one and this yes. one? Yes. No, these are actually independent, so there's nothing. 
So this, this comes mathematically, this comes from uh, the monoidal structure, which is given by just, well, parallel composition means you, that things operate independently. So in probabilistic terms, these are independent. And this is important uh, in what's coming up. So from the observed behavior here, I can make some in inferences or derive some constraints about what the observed behavior of this hypothetical network could be. And, and these are just crucial observations here. So if I look at this uh, hypothetical inflated network and I discard C, then I can apply this back propagation uh, of, uh, yeah, of that discarding operation and, and this part will just completely disappear. So that means that I'm basically looking at a subnetwork that, that looks that corresponds to this left half. Um, yeah, like this. And the important observation is that this looks exactly like uh, taking this original network and discarding C here and then applying the back propagation. The only difference is that I've moved the SAC to the left, but that's just a notation. Okay, is that clear? <clears throat> And uh, the other crucial observation is that if I take this new network and I discard B, then again I apply the back propagation here, and this disconnects into two components, which are now independent. So this translates into probabilistic independence. <clears throat> okay, so now this means that we have, uh, can derive, we have derived some conditions on but the observed behavior uh, ABC of the new network can possibly be. Um, and so first, the first uh, observation is that A and B have the same behavior or the same observed distribution as in the original network because of this, because in both cases the, the distribution is generated by, by this network. So by perfectly uncorrelated, you mean perfectly? Uh, I mean perfectly correlated. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I guess it's a typo. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <clears throat> and likewise for B and C. And finally, we have this independence that uh, when we discard B, then it disconnects. So this implies that A and C must be independent. Yeah. But now it turns out these constraints are so strong that they're actually inconsistent. There is no giant distribution which has all of these properties. <clears throat> uh, and this implies that, well, the assumption that we started with, namely that uh, this was a feasible hypothesis, hypothesis, must have been wrong to begin with. So this is the basic uh, idea of the method. <clears throat> Yes. Right. yes. Yeah. Right. Well, in this case, I'm using the property that, uh, well, I'm mainly using that the unit object is terminal. But for example, the, uh, the, this first point, uh, I mean, I, I'm sort of looking at marginals of the, I mean, what's the word? This one? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, you're using, so that seems like a specific thing. This is only now for kind of to make it easy to understand, but I can formulate a general technique uh, it's, it's basically a kind of marginal problem, or maybe you would call it chief theoretic uh, contextuality again. Um, <laughs> but, so, but it's independent of which, what, what the symmetric monoidal category is. Yes, yes, one can make sense of this uh, in any symmetric monoidal category where the unit object is terminal. So there, a marginal problem would mean that you have a morphism, or yeah, you know, uh, you, want to infer what a morphism is, which has a bunch of outputs, when you know what the morphism is when you're just after discarding some of these outputs. You're basically given a family of marginals, and you want to know what the joint distribution is. This we can make sense of in any symmetric monodal category with discarding, right? And so that's the general, that would be the general technique. <coughs> yeah. Uh, but this actually has additional structure, which is also useful. 
uh, that one can make copies of systems. So this is uh, kind of related to this hypergraph category that I've heard about earlier. Although stochastic matrices are not a hypergraph category, but only kind of half of it in a sense, we can only make, we can make copies of systems. Just copy it, you can take a random variable and just copy its value. Uh, and this will, yeah, I will draw this kind of morphism like this. So this equips every um, object with a co-monoid co structure, together with, so the discarding operation being the co-unit. Uh, and yeah, so one can make use of this for uh, this inflation technique to make it more powerful, uh, meaning that one can write down more inflated networks inflated networks which also contain this copying operation. Uh, and so yeah, I'd like to present an example of how this works. Um, and this is actually well known to some of the people here who study things like Bell's theorem. Uh, so this is uh, now a stochastic matrix or a conditional probability distribution um, which takes two inputs and two outputs uh, and so let's say all these variables are binary. And so I'm kind of using mod 2 arithmetic here. So this is kind of uh, x or, and if you want to turn out bits in here, it's just multiplication. So this is a conditional distribution, which if both x and y um, are 1, and this evaluates to 1, that means that this a plus b uh, equals 1 holds whenever a and b are different. Well, if uh, one of them is, at least one of them takes the value zero, then this evaluates to zero. And then in mod two arithmetic, that means that this condition holds if and only if A and B are the same. Uh, and actually, there should have been a half, uh, not a, a quarter. Um, yeah. So when at least one of them takes the value zero, then what comes out here is a perfect correlation between A and B. Um, and again, kind of unbiased binary variables. While if both of them have their value one, then what comes out here is perfect anti-correlation. <clears throat> yeah. And so now the hypothesis would be that, um, that this observed behavior is generated by this sort of network topology. It seems kind of maybe reasonable to, uh, to begin with because if you discard, for example, A, you look at this network topology, that, that means that this B cannot depend on X. And so this is certainly the case here. If you take the marginal over A, then B is just uniformly random, no matter what X is, so it doesn't depend on X. So the, from this perspective, it looks promising. Uh, but it's actually the whole hypothesis is still not feasible, but now this needs something a little bit more sophisticated to show. Uh, and so this is actually what's known as Bell's theorem, sort of. Uh, so I'm not saying really anything new, but maybe it's just in a, from a bit of a different perspective. <clears throat> yeah, and so the inflation network that one can use to, to show this infeasibility would look like this. You take uh, this original morphism lambda here, and you apply this co-monoid, the copying operation here on, uh, uh, yeah, on both of these wires. Um, and so then you take copies of these boxes um, and construct this new inflated network. <clears throat> yeah, and now we again make some inferences about the possible behavior of this network from the uh, assumed behavior of the original one. And so this is as follows. Um, if we put in, plug in particular values here, let's say we take this to be zero, uh, we take this to be zero, um, and we take this to be one, and this to be one, then that must result yeah, okay, maybe I should have phrased this in a bit more, a bit of a different way. But yeah, so, okay, if we discard a, a, the A naught here, and we discard the V naught, then again, we can do the back propagation um, of, of this uh, co-unit. 
and we'll find that again we are left with a network that looks just like the original one. So the observed behavior regarding only A1 and B1 is exactly the same as in the original one. And likewise for um, A0 and B1, for example, or actually for any one of the four possible combinations of taking one of these A's and one of these B's. That's the same behavior as in the original one. And so now in addition to um, this, I'm going to plug in particular values for these input variables. <coughs> uh, yeah, and if I plug in these particular values, well, I will get only a joint distribution of these four variables. And by what I, had, what I was just saying about uh, discarding um, one of these, <clears throat> this observed distribution will have to probably that this A0 and a B0 are perfectly correlated. And your marginal distribution after I have discarded A1 and B1. Likewise, uh, B0 and A1 are perfectly correlated. A1 and B0 are perfectly correlated. Sorry, this is again a typo. And finally, B1 and A1 are perfectly correlated. Uh, Anti-correlated. <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if this is clear, but I hope at least the basic idea has kind of become clear. Uh, yeah. And again, one can show that there is no distribution of four variables that would have these properties, and so hence we have an infeasible hypothesis. <clears throat> yeah, so this is a basic outline um, of, of the technique by example. Um, yeah, and that's, that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Jamie, so do you have a good sense for what, I mean, these were ad hoc examples, right? Uh -huh. Do you have a good sense of the general power of this technique? What sort of things can be ruled out, or is it hard? Yeah. Uh, it, it seems hard to make general statements. Um, I guess the most obvious question is whether if you apply this now to all inflated networks, you get necessary and sufficient conditions for feasibility. Uh, and this seems not to be the case, but we don't have a formal proof of that yet. The slightly magical step is where at the end you say, but well, there's no distribution with these properties, right? That's, yeah. I mean, that, that, I mean, that step really matters, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Well, well, they all matter. I mean, they're, yeah. <laughs> but, and, but these all steps can also be generalized. I mean, you can make sense of these in all symmetric monol categories with discarding and possibly with copying. Um, but I can't really say much about how powerful the technique actually is. So it certainly gives necessary conditions and but probably not sufficient ones in general. In the case of causal inference, it also depends a lot on what can derive additional constraints that do not work, <laughs> they do not generalize to other symmetric monodal categories, and that also makes it more powerful there. But we don't know whether anything becomes sufficient in any sense. You had a 